Hello and welcome to this afternoon's session of the virtual tour. Uh, we're featuring Myers Farms Incorporated of Union Grove, North Carolina. Uh, my name is Matthew Lang and I am the Dairy Development uh, Coordinator for the North Carolina Dairy Advantage and we're the sponsor of today's virtual tour. Uh, North Carolina Dairy Advantage is an organization that was started by dairy producers and the dairy industry in North Carolina. Uh, our mission is to grow the dairy industry uh, increase milk production and increase the profitable opportunities for dairy producers that are there. So we work with a lot of existing dairy farmers, we work with new young dairy farmers getting started and we also are all uh, open to looking for anybody who would love to move cows to North Carolina and start a dairy there as well. Um, we're very excited about the dairy industry in North Carolina. We have a proud dairy heritage uh, but we're very excited about the future, and Barry and Mary Jane Myers uh, are successful dairy producers, and th what they strive for in their dairy production uh, is what we're hoping for the entire industry in our state. Uh, so we're going to get started here. Uh, we've got a 20-minute video presentation. Uh, Barry and Mary Jane will then talk a little bit more about their uh, repro management, and uh, then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Thank you very much for attending. I dairy because I love the dairy. Uh, growing up on the farm, I fell in love with cows and I enjoy the uh, crop production also and enjoy working with my family and the rural lifestyle. I dairy because I love the dairy. Uh, growing up on the farm, I fell in love with cows and I enjoy the uh, crop production also and enjoy working with my family and the rural lifestyle. I have a passion for cows. Just, just really do find comfort in, in looking at their silly shenanigans and, and, and I I don't want to brag, but I just have a good feel for them. I, you know, I can hear a cow in heat two barns down. Dad fell in love with uh, dairy cattle uh, by being involved in 4-H. He went to World War II and flew Air Sea Rescue B-17, and he said that when he came home, if he lived and came home from the war, he was going to start a dairy, and he did. Him and my grandfather started a dairy together in 1947, a grade B dairy cow to, uh, cow to can. Then in 1960, he bought my grandfather out and built a double six herringbone uh, with loafing sheds and upright silos. And, and then that, that facility was run uh, by him and then by me for uh, 30 years until we built the facility that we're in now. Well, we met in ninth grade homeroom and kind of just knew each other through the years and became really good friends as juniors and as seniors we started dating. One of his passions is bluegrass music so he, he went out to Colorado to be a musician and I was at state writing letters missing him and 
wrote him a letter and said, if you'll come home, we'll get married. When we were married in 74, uh, we were milking, uh, milking about 100 cows. Then in the late 80s, we realized that, that we were just getting really overcrowded and the facilities were just wore out. The new facility that we built in 91, after a couple years of planning, what consisted of our double 16 herringbone parlor uh, and also two freestyle barns capable of holding 260 cows apiece. After getting it up and running in January of 92, after the first year, we realized we were going to have to build more cows to make it cash flow. And so we started another freestyle barn in 93. Then we built uh, two more freestyle barns in 98. That's where we're at as far as our freestyle capability now on milking cows. You know, when we moved into the new facility, we lost the employees that had been milking in the old. It was just, it was too much, too fast, because one day you're milking in a double, double six and moving milkers back and forth and, and everything. It got up to be 14 hours just to milk one milking and we got up to the new barn and you could run at that time we had 14 on each side and and you were milking all 14 at once and it was just you know we had we had to rethink our day-to-day -day processes as the cows are loaded they are uh, dipped with a uh, half percent iodine and stripped and then we do four in a row and then go back to the first cow, wipe her with a single service cloth towel. After she's built, we dip with 1% iodine. everything that you could possibly do with freestyles I think through, through the years I've tried you know the first ones I was involved with building I was just a kid and they were just oak lumber and uh, boxed in terribly boxed in and the cows wouldn't use them very good and then uh, we did the tires filled with dirt and put sawdust on top of that then when we built the new facility we tried mattresses I uh, used mattresses for 13 years, tried five different types of mattresses, and finally gave up the fight and put in sand and found out the winning approach. Uh, one thing I would point out in our transition to sand is we took the concrete that was formed and poured ready for mattresses and just added a four inch PVC pipe to the back of it uh, thunder studded it down every four feet and shot the sand right in there and that has worked really well. It drains well, it, the cows self-level it and we, we really think that's a good way to do it. Uh, our nutrient management plan is uh, based around 
a drag hose system uh, that we do about 550 acres and then the other balance of the 1,285 acres that um, crop, cropping uh, is tank applied. Since 2000, uh, i focused on risk management by building heifer facilities to do a better job of raising our heifers, getting them into the milking stream faster and healthier. Uh, also have added on uh, more trench silos, been able to acquire more acreage and build more feed inventory to take us through the dry years. most important part of our reproductive success is our people, our cow comfort, and our protocol. And uh, our people are what makes all the other aspects work. Uh, you can have all the, the perfect protocol, and if they don't follow it correctly, it's not going to work. So, so that's the reason I put people first. And then the cow comfort, the sand beds, uh, the, which gives the cows uh, the comfort, the low somatic cell counts, and some traction to ride uh, is important. And then following the protocol that we, we've set, uh, and we've, we've changed that through the years, but we're, what we're doing now is really working. It's a very systematic approach uh, here at Myers Farm as far as generating pregnancies. They use a, uh, uh, a pre-sync, off-sync, uh, 1411, off sync 56, strict timed AI uh, protocol for first service. Uh, then they uh, use detector tail paint to, to chalk uh, tail heads to find the repeat services uh, and then resynchronize uh, their cows at, at herd check, which they do on a weekly basis uh, with a double GNRH off sync 56 program. 
Our morning plan is to walk through each herd and mark tailheads. And the blue is, they're still in the breeding herd, and the green means they've already been diagnosed pregnant. The tail marking has been a great asset as far as, as catching heats. Uh, and then in the afternoon, whether he or I are on, we go through again and do that. And so we spend a lot of time out with the cows and with the heifers when, when we think we're caught up with five groups of breeding, breeding groups of cows. Then we head out to the heifer lot and spend some time watching them and really the only thing we have out there is, is their riding. The, the heifer breeding program, uh, they have a voluntary wait period on the heifers of uh, 388 days. They get a shot of prostaglandin coming into the breeding pen. Uh, we use sex semen first two services on, on uh, uh, the, the strong heats. Any questionable heats we drop back and use conventional semen. Uh, any heifer that's been in the breeding pen for 13 months um, is, is put on a five-day cedar sink uh, program, and so that ensures a, a service in those heifers within 30 days of entering the breeding pen. Each person that gives a shot or, or breeds a cow or anything treats an animal, you've got to write it down on the barn report, enter it right into the computer, or write it on a report that then will be entered into the computer. Uh, we rely heavily on the reports that we are able then to print out and use on a daily management basis. The genetic selection here at Myers Farm is, 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 is really balanced. Uh, these guys have em emphasized some of the fitness traits early on uh, in their selection process. Um, uh, with that being productive life, daughter pregnancy rate, and somatic sale. Uh, the confirmation uh, traits that we really go after is uh, uh, we want to ensure uh, super good udders, uh, sound feet and legs, and we want moderate framed cattle. They uh, started using sex semen, probably one of the first uh, uh, producers in the country to use sex semen as we brought uh, sex semen to the marketplace. They actually did some field trials here. And again, uh, as I said earlier, they use it first two services, inversion heifers only, and then move on conventional semen. As a manager, I focus on the overall day-to-day -day operation of the dairy and putting out the fires day-to-day -day and then the, the crop production and then the nutrient management. That's, that's my main focus. I've had to learn not to micromanage so much. That's one thing I, uh, I did learn, and, that, and especially with family. <laughs> Basically, everybody knows that if they if they have a problem or they have a question, they know which person to go to with it. Mary Jane and I have worked together for 37 years, and uh, we've got pretty good at it, and we, we, I enjoy working with her very much. And uh, every, day's, uh, every day's a joy to be with her.
early on, we did everything side by side. I was his right-hand girl and, and loved every minute of it, but it got to the point where I had a little more patience with the cows than he did, but it's probably because he had all these 50, 11 other things going on in his mind. What day to plant, what day to start the harvest, what day to book feed, uh, what day not to book feed. I mean, it's it's always a, always challenges. And then the same thing with equipment, what equipment we need to replace, try to be proactive. Uh, I need a new gator. <laughs> Here on the farm, we have a lot of different individuals now with, with 23, 24 employees, counting family. And every person's different. Every person has a different set of circumstances they're bringing to the job in the morning. And I just think that, that we've been able to come with an attitude of, we love what we do, so why not make it an enjoyable time? The success here for Myers Farm, um, uh, not only in the reproductive arena, but uh, uh, somatic cell, herd health, um, is, is the attention first and foremost, attention to details. Um, uh, you know, starts with uh, uh, high quality homegrown forages, uh, cow comforts, paramount, uh, and then the people aspect. Um, just long tenured people that's committed to the success of the dairy, uh, real team players. And, and the execution of the plan. Uh, uh, most farms these days have a plan, whether it be uh, their milking procedure, the reproductive protocols. Uh, my opinion, the difference between an average farm, a good farm, the difference between a good farm and a great farm is the execution uh, of that plan. And, and these guys execute every day. And I, and I think that's the big difference uh, that we see here. All right, this is going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> we get to take and, you know, stop and start. So. so this is going to be the real thing here, I guess. Okay, welcome to the virtual tour of Myers Farms. My name is Barry Myers, and I'm accompanied by my wife, Mary Jane. And we're glad to be here. We've had a lot of fun here at Expo already, and glad to have everybody with us. Our farm lies in the northwest Piedmont of North Carolina. We're about 20 miles north of uh, the I-40, I-77 interchange which is uh, in Statesville, North Carolina. And then this is a shot of the, of the main dairy facility. And our heifer facility would be, if I was standing here, it would be right, right over yonder. So we don't have a picture of that today. Uh, this focus is, uh, is on our reproductive summary. Uh, our percent herd pregnant is currently 48%, which is 5% higher than needed to achieve a 13.5 month calving interval for our current days in milk of 161. Uh, current 21 day pregnancy rate is 29%. Our first conception, uh, first service conception rate is 42% and overall conception rate is 36 and insemination rate is averaging 83%. We're proud of that and trying to, trying to do better all the time. And there's a shot of our girls 
to make it all worthwhile there. Here's our first service protocol. Uh, as uh, formerly stated, we use this precinct 1411 off sync 56 program. It's a strict timed AI program, uh, but we do allow breeding on standing heats uh, after 62 days in milk after the, that GNRH shot. And then all cows receive first service between 72 and 78 days in milk. Our first service conception rate average is 43%, and almost half the herd is pregnant by 78 days of milk. And so here's a shot of Mary Jane breeding. She's the main stud on the farm. <laughs> Studly, that's right. Uh, this is a scatter, a scatter plot that shows our days in milk at first service, and uh, of course our goal is to have everybody bred by 80 days, which is the green line, and the average right now is running 74, the blue line. Uh, the, the red dots are the first lactation cows, the black dots are second and later, and and of course, you see the, these, the ones that are below are the cows were breeding on natural heat after that 62 day range. Then you got this one really, really out here outlier. I'm blaming that one on Mary Jane on her sweetheart cow that she just couldn't wait on, I think. <laughs> uh, we're using the, the detector tail paint. Uh, to find cows and repeat estrus. Uh, we use this, the uh, blue detector on the uh, cows in, that are, need to be bred and or could be repeating. And then once they're confirmed pregnant, we use the green marker to, to know which ones are already pregnant that we uh, don't need to mark so much. But of course, if you do have a repeat, there we can catch them that way too, it really helps. Uh, this is our resync protocol. Uh, cows are injected with uh, GNRH seven days prior to the preg check. <coughs> and then started on an off-sync program 56 if they're checked open. And by giving this extra GNRH shot seven days before uh, the preg check, uh, we can immediately start them, and it cuts about two weeks off of the rebreed. So, so this this has been a good program, and it helped us to get the cows bred faster. Uh, this is just a shot in the freestall barn. You can see the uh, drive-through feed lanes, the lockups. There's where we do all of our breeding, all of our reproductive work as they come from the parlor, set the locks, and they lock themselves. Uh, we've got the sprinklers here and the fans, row of fans down the freestalls, I mean the headlocks and a row down the freestalls. And also you can see these shades on the outside. We put those up in the summer just to help on the cooling and uh, take them down in the winter. You don't have to have the curtains like you do here in Wisconsin. <laughs> this bar graph is showing our insemination rate, heat detection, uh, average, which is running 83% right here. We feel real good about that. Uh, always striving to do better, though. And then this bar graph is showing our 21-day pregnancy rate with a 29% average.
Here's, a, here's another shot of the freestyle barn, just uh, showing the cows, showing how clean they stay, uh, showing the good, good leg, the good udders. The cooling system, it was work, it's working, of course, during the summer here while these shots were taken. This bar graph is showing our consumption rate by service and lactation number. Uh, the blue bar is all lactations. Uh, the, the red would be first, the black second, and the white would be third lactation and later. And then, of course, across the bottom, we've got service one, two, three, and four. And it looks pretty good. This, by the time we get out to the fourth, fourth service, the number's getting pretty low. So these, these bars might jump around just because of the low number of animals that are involved. And then here's a, a chart on our heifer performance. Uh, age at first breeding, 389 days. And we're getting 86% of, of them bred uh, by the first cycle past the voluntary waiting period. Uh, we're getting 49% of them pregnant on that first breeding. And then by the third breeding, and so these first two would be sex semen, by the third breeding, we'd have 75% of them pregnant. And the uh, fresh heifer calving age right now is averaging 23.1 months. All right, here's a, a four-year rolling herd average graft. Right here is where we quit using Pozolac. This was January of 2008. Uh, at that time, our uh, at that time our herd average days in milk was 230 days. And with this led to a rapid decline in a rolling herd average, as you can see. But our reproductive rates started greatly improving. And then this resulted in decreased reproductive culling, and then a decreased calving interval, and increased replacement heifers, increased voluntary culling, and then ultimately our Days in milk have fallen to 160 days, and our rolling herd average, as you can see, is higher than ever. And actually, our latest one that we just got before we got on the plane, we'd, we were over 28,000. So we're on a good up, upward momentum and hope to keep that going. And then this is a... Semitic sale count summary for the last four years. Uh, you know, it wasn't too shabby at this point. We had already put in sand uh, two years before, and we were staying in this, you know, 130, 140 range, getting lower at times. That would have been, that was in July, uh, July right there. But um, sand bedding, careful animal handling, uh, improved heat abatement, consistent milking protocols, consistent equipment maintenance of the milking system, and uh, an aggressive voluntary cu uh, culling has consistently improved our somatic cell count, which has improved our reproductive success. And I was told we're supposed to brag, which, you know, farmers is hard to brag, but, but uh, we have received... Uh, Numerous Cobblestone Co-op Quality Awards and, and the NC State Don Wieson uh, 
Platinum Quality Award for uh, several years in a row. So you can see where we've gone. And if you can see in the last few years, we've been, it's even in the summer, we're staying down. We used to have a little more spike in the summer. And this is the final shot. This is our McClanahan sand separator, which allows us to, to uh, provide clean, uh, unlimited, basically, quantities of sand to use it on freestyle um, because we get to recycle it and use it over and over. And this has been a good tool. This is what enabled us to go away from the mattresses and go to the, go to the sand bedding. And I'd just like to thank you uh, for the NC Dairy Advantage for submitting our farm to be the virtual tour and for their support of our dairy farmers in North Carolina. They are doing a wonderful job. And Matt, I believe I'll just turn it over to you. <laughs> um, okay, at this time, it, we can open it up to questions. Uh, Barry and Mary Jane are mic'd up here, so uh, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. We just ask you to stand up. Say it loudly. That way we can hear you. Yes, Dr. Washburn. Uh, point well taken. <laughs> Maybe NC State Red, is that you think would would work better? Okay. All right. Any questions, uh, it doesn't matter to me if it's reproduction, uh, sand, uh, nutrition, anything. Our culling rate, and I didn't bring it, it's probably back up. We, were, we had got down to 28%. We're back up because we are crowded with heifers, and uh, we're probably up in the around 40, mm -hmm. 40 or 43 right now. 43. And it's, very, it's really voluntary culling. We're, we're culling a lot of animals that, culling animals it would be hard for me to have let go in the past, but uh, we're, we're, we're overcrowded and we're just trying to, to, to keep better in the herd, just keeping the top genetics. Any advice to dairy producers who might be looking at expand, expansion? Expansion. Uh, yeah, my advice uh, for expansion is to is, is to remember to look at the whole picture, look at your uh, not only what you're going to do for your for your parlor and your cows and your waste handling there, but to also really focus on your what your heifer raising program is going to be like. Uh, if you're going to be able to do it on farm, or if you want to try to custom custom it out. And um, uh, and then, of course, I guess the other thing is just uh, get ready to deal with the permitting process and the and the and the public, and and hopefully we're up to that. That's that's something we didn't used to have to do so much, but that's that's the reality of the world we live in now. So that's that's a big part of it. You know, get up in front talking in front of a bunch of folks is something that I don't do very much, but I think we have to learn to do that more. And the only way to do it is to get up here and do it, <laughs> much as you might, might feel uncomfortable. <laughs> of course, y'all are a great crowd because y'all are farmers. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, in a permitting process, we're probably going to have to do it in front of folks that are going to be a little antagonistic. So just don't lose your cool. <laughs> Uh, start in the back there first, uh, red shirt. Uh, you're using a free sink harvesting program. Uh, did you compare that to a TC testing system? Uh, 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 an automated system? Yes. We haven't uh, as far as, not, not when we originally started it and then after 
the successes we've had in doing what we're doing, we have been approached with some systems and talked it over, and at this point, we just don't think it's worth the hassle of keeping up with moving all those transponders, uh, you know, when we can get the cows pregnant like we do now. We're, we're, we're satisfied with what we're doing. Not to say that down the road we might do that. Uh, we're always open to change, always looking uh, to see what's the latest and the greatest. But right now... We did do several trials with Virginia Tech, actually, and they, they had a... Remember the little transponder that had, like, three light system on the tail head and... Mm -hmm. and that didn't work out real well for us. And, but then they came with the protocols, and we tried several different protocols and, and came up with this precinct sync off sync 56, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Do you do any uh, embryo transfers? Uh, no, sir. We, we have not. We're running a great herd. Um, have bought many registered animals through the years, but we've just... we we. At this point, have always run a great herd and have not uh, done any embryo transfer. Got some neighbors doing it, uh, have been doing it for, that have been doing it for years. But there, there again, there's something maybe for the future. Uh, with the sex semen, we are really, we've really been blessed that and the the improved reproductive rates. We just have a lot of heifers coming on. Period. So we're able to to call pretty heavily to help keep the best and sort of move on the rest is what we're doing. What is your percentage on sex, sex semen or the heifers? Uh, on the heifers, I think we're, we had, were running the last time we looked, and it, you know, maybe don't analyze everything as much as some folks, but we were, were in the 90% range, maybe 92 at times. So it was pretty much doing what it said, uh, what it's supposed to do. Which is why the heifer barns are full. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What days are you doing preg checking and what are you using? We, we preg check on the milk cows uh, once a week, every Monday. Uh, we're preg checking at 36 days and we're doing uh, rectal palpation. Um, our vet has been with us. A long time he has not gone to the uh, uh, ultrasound. ultrasound yet, yeah. But uh, that may be something in the future that we do go to. I would, I, I really think we, you know, I sort of want to go to it, but we haven't made that move yet. Uh, then we're we're preg checking our heifers every two weeks now. That's one thing we were only preg checking heifers once a month for a long time. At forty-five days. Uh, yeah, and checking them at 45 days. And we we saw we were having some slippage on heifers, and, and, and one big thing on our heifer facility is they have become pretty overcrowded, and it really has hurt us some on our heat detection out there. So to overcome that, we've gone to, to preg checking them every two weeks, and then we're doing the five-day cedar on anything we find open. We're having a really good success with the five-day cedar program. And I, do, I did make a note in case you had. On this five-day cedar, we're, we're putting the cedar in on day zero, right when she's checked open. Uh, we're taking it out on the, uh, the fifth day and giving her loo lice and then breeding on either standing heat or time breeding everybody, uh, let's see, on the, on the eighth day after the... Uh, after the uh, cedar was out and loo lice was given. And our, I don't have the figure, but the, the conception rate's been really high doing that. So we're real enthused with that. Been to, you know, this five day we, we've only been doing probably a year, maybe, yeah. about a year on the cedars. And one thing I'll say on using cedars and heifers is we completely pull that tail out. We, we don't leave the tail at all. We've tried snipping it every way you want to. Just take it out, insert it in, and then when you're ready to take it out rectally, just just work, bring it back and, and pull it out. Otherwise, they'll be gone. <laughs> Any 
Yes, Steve. There's been a few published studies that with uh, time breeding and then checking with ultrasound 28 days and then rechecking at 56 days or beyond, which is some loss of pregnancy. Would you check him at 36 days? Are you seeing some losses? And, and if so, what percent beyond that? We are rechecking three weeks after she's been diagnosed pregnant, he palpates again, and I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, in the summer it's a little higher, but we're losing very few. So that that's actually putting you out in that 30, about that 56 day rate, right? Just doing it a little, a little different. Sometimes, at one point we were checking up about 42 or 44, if I remember right, because I was a little concerned on palpation and closed gut syndrome, but we've been able to move back and don't seem to be having that problem anymore. So maybe that was just me worrying about a few that I saw, you know. But. Any other questions? How many times a day do you breathe? Basically, uh, all day long. All day. <laughs> <laughs> All day long, basically. In other words, they locked up and uh, they observed cows going to the parlor for natural heat, every group as they're going. Um, and then as cows are coming out and locking up to, be, to eat, they're breeding. So they're going through each group as they come back from the parlor. The heifers are bred sort of periodically, uh, Mary Jane and Carl, my two main breeders, uh, what I try to do when I'm on, uh, I, I work a lot of weekends so that if I want to be away, then he'll work for me. But uh, Thursdays is, is the day that we time AI, and so we, we lock up the cows as they come out and breed each group because that's the way the shots were given on that Monday and Thursday. And, um, and then otherwise, if I'm on, then I come in and try to walk through the groups before they're loaded and then if it's, if it's timed right, I'll go over and I'll watch them load a group of cows to see if there's any standing heat. But really by that point, I've already made my notes of, of who's, who I think has been rode by the, the paint. And lots of times I can, can get a cow bred before she goes into milk because who's to say she wasn't riding. And especially if she's laying in a stall and her paint's gone, then I know that I need to get her bred now instead of waiting until she comes back out in three hours or four. So it's it's kind of a nonstop. Uh, we do try to, to walk through each of the breeding groups and remark the paint twice a day. And in between that, then you're going and watching the heifers. And indeed, with the overcrowding with the heifers, it's, it's harder to watch because heifers are just wide open because everybody's up and playing. But... If you time it right with the feeding and, and everybody settling back down, then you can catch the heifers then. So. We don't have anybody breeding at night, though. Well, basically, no. it starts from about 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., basically. And, yeah. and then the, the tail chalks doing, or tail paints doing the heat detection during the night for us. Although we're milking three times a day, there's no one breeding at night. And with the precinct, I think you've... Uh, you know, there's there might be a Tuesday when you breed three cows, and then the Tuesday that I'm on, I might breed 20. So it's kind of <laughs> you never know. And and the weekends, some weekends are are real slow, and some I'm just breeding all the way through church. <laughs> so you seem to be doing an excellent job. What is your one biggest on the reproduction? One biggest problem. That's a loaded. Question. That's, loaded. <laughs> That's really loaded. I'm trying. To, one. Price could always be high. Well, yeah, yeah, and, and uh, one biggest problem. I don't know. I'm having trouble. I'm, I'm having trouble bringing that one up. I mean, we all have one week. One problem is our biggest problem, and another one is something else. But I think overall. We've got a fairly balanced approach and don't have any major. Uh, there's no major breaks in, in the length of the chain or we would not have the success we've got now. Yeah. So if we could just keep things on track, 
and keep making little improvements, I think we're going to be. Communication can be a hard thing, whether it's between yeah. us or, or other employees or our sons or whatever, but I, you just have, like I said, you have to come with a positive attitude. Somebody's got to keep spirits up. <laughs> I mean, some days that's Do just what it is. Uh, no, sir. We, our employees, uh, most of our employees have been long-term employees. Uh, we have very, very little turnover. Uh, some, some of us are getting a little older, long in the tooth, I guess you might say. And so, I, you know, one day, Ethan, Ethan's are, are, Ethan and Josh are two sons. I guess they're going to have to replace us all. So, so, so we'll see. <laughs> Uh, my our oldest son Ethan is one is our biggest decision maker, uh, handling the cows day to day now and, and, and actually the functioning in the in the parlor, um, and, and also has taken taken pretty much complete control on sire selection. Still likes dad to have a little input, but but I'm letting him. Pretty, I mean, pretty much I've backed completely out of that. Um, or as I'm focusing more on the uh, t just the day-to-day -day mechanics of the farm, waste management, uh, crop production, and, uh, you know, just like this past Sunday, come, we come back from church, and, and our uh, other son, Josh, was on, on that morning, and he, we had a, uh, one of the, Coolers wasn't cooling down very fast. And he said, everything's running. And so I, I stop in my Sunday shoes and go out and, and look. And it looks like everything's running, but we had a compressor out, you know. So just knowing those little things, I guess that's, it, it takes time to impart those things to, to folks. But we, we've, got, uh, we've got good help with nutrition from our uh, Perina representative. He comes weekly, works with us on that. Um, yes, we just, and, and our veterinarian. We just got a good team overall. Everybody chips in. Ethan's in herd, uh, herd health. I mean, he deals mostly with that, with the uh, ordering of, of supplies and, and mm -hmm. keeps up with the vaccination program, keeps all of us. I mean, he makes the reports and sends the right people out to, to do those things. And it's just like with the uh, precinct, five-sync protocol. He, you know, I've, I, I, I do it, but he knows the numbers. He works the numbers and, and prints it out, and then we go follow through. Uh, I do financial records. I didn't go to school to know anything about accounting, but I'm doing the best I know how. Pretty good Keeping account. it going, so... <laughs> Program? Well, I made a list. I was afraid somebody might ask me that. <laughs> Give me a second. I'll pull it out of my, out of all my goodies. Good for you. <laughs> all right, our heifers uh, at birth, I mean, when they're like the nice shot of the calf just being born, immediately gets E. coli plus C20 and calf guard orally and then colostrum which we do harvest and uh, uh, check and only keep our best colostrum for our heifer calves. Uh, that's within the first 30 minutes. And then at uh, three to four weeks, they get the TSV2 vaccine, and we dock their tails. Uh, eight to nine weeks, they get Bovashield Gold FP5, Ultrabac 8, one shot, and their RFID tag. And then at four to five months, we're given the Bovashill Gold FP5L5, Lepto 5, Ultrabac 8, one shot. We are doing the brucellosis vaccine. That's, of course, done with the veterinarian. And we're given a Decamax wormer at the four to five month stage. And then pre-breeding, we give another shot of the Bovashill Gold fp 5L5, and then 42 days prepartum, we're giving Bovashield Gold 
FP5, UltraBac 8, Endobac Bovi, Immune Plus, and then the Clostridium Provenges Type A Toxoid. And I'm pretty sure they've had a shot of you that. you want a copy of that? I think I do. <laughs> uh, and then 21 days, pre you, want to, you know, I can keep on, but 21 days prepartum, they get UltraBac 8, Endobac Bovi, Immune Plus, Clostridium perfinges, type A toxoid, and then the ultra boss poron. That's during the fly season, the ultra, ultra boss poron. And we also, and that's an important thing I'll say in our heifer program, is we also do uh, a fly, we use a fly spray on heifers and our uh, dry cows and spring and, uh, springers, where we actually use some fly spray that we actually direct right under down on the udder just to keep those biting flies away from their teats uh, when we do have flies. Um, this is, that was the heifer program. Okay. <laughs> then, and then the cows at 30, 35 days of milk, Bovishill Gold, FP5L5, 150 days of milk, the Leptofirm 5, and the Endovac Bovi, Immune Plus, and that, and then at dry off, we use the Alba Dry Plus. We use Orbisil, uh, Bovashil Gold, FP5, UltraBac 8, Endovac Bovi Immune Plus, and again, the Clostridium Perfringes Type A Toxoid. And the last round, uh, <laughs> at close up, so which is three weeks before calving, uh, UltraBac 8, the end, Endovac Bovi Immune Plus, Clostridium. Clostridium perfinges, type A toxoid, and then the ultra boss poron for fly control. So we, we do a lot of vaccination. Preventative is the key to us. We don't want to have sick cattle, you know, ever if we can help it. And, and so the vaccination is very important to us to have a very strict protocol. And it's not just whole herd type. Everything's done on these daily things. We generate the list. And, and every week, somebody's getting something. That's, and with the lockups, we also have our heifer barns, which I don't guess we really got a good shot. Well, the shot of Mary Jane and I walking, that was in a heifer barn. They're in lockups and free stalls also. So same thing, run the feed wagon down, they all come in, lock them, and the ones that need their vaccines, they get it. And so that's, that's our vaccination schedule. <laughs> there will be a test. The next generation in. How? Yeah. Uh, well, e uh, Ethan is 35. 35. <laughs> the oldest son, Ethan, is 35, and he was a dairy farmer at by eight years old. Three. Uh, he uh, helped me feed calves when he was three. Well, yeah. And, and really was bound and determined at by eight and, and went to NC State got dual degrees in, in uh, animal science and agribusiness and could do a lot better standing up here than I can do, i tell you that. But, so that was his, you know, he, so we had him all along wanting to come. And then the, our middle son, Josh, was uh, more uh, uh, artsy and wanted to, said, Worked hard on the farm and enjoyed the enjoyed the dairy. Uh, Very good cow person. Good cow person and uh, and a good equipment man too. When he runs equipment, he's more careful than a lot of folks. Doesn't tear up stuff. But when he left to go to college, he he told me the last day he worked. He said, "Dad, uh, you know, love to work in here, but this will be the last day on the farm for me. I'll be here to visit once in a while." And we didn't see him again until he graduated. Basically, I mean, just except for Christmas. But when he graduated, he came back to the farm. He's married now, got two grandchildren. He's there to stay also. So, and then our younger son, uh, he's, he's... Uh, just turned 30. He just turned 30, and he, he loves being his own boss and don't want Dad to tell him hardly anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's, run, he's got his own business, and he's very successful in Raleigh with a home improvement business, so... We've been blessed uh, from that standpoint. I think what I see in our area for the, the, the dairies that have not been able to move and, and transition has been, a, has been the inability of, 
of uh, parents to let their kids to take home, make their own mistakes, and and always, you know, a lot of folks are just always down, and we try to be a little more upbeat. Not to say I don't get down once in a while, but I think that's a big reason that, that people have not stayed on the dairy. Can you count them in percentages, or how are they involved? Right now, the, uh, uh, basically working for wages, punch clock, or by the hour. Uh, do own, do have some land ownership uh, that they're working on, and uh, that's something we get we, we're getting ready to work on. Needing to work on more. My dad uh, just passed. Uh, my mom passed uh, in '01, and dad passed in '06, and we're still trying to finalize all of the all of our generations. Uh, we have a brother in the business, and yeah. something's got to be dealt with so that we can move on to the next generation. Yeah. yeah, we don't have all of that completed yet and still working on it. So once we get that done, we really want to plan on, on the next step because I don't want to wait to the last minute. We don't want the government, the for sure we don't want the government to make those decisions for us. So, So that's... It's a good question, a hard question to answer. But I will say, again, I would reiterate that if you're in a business and you've got kids, uh, I guess two things. Our, our willingness to grow provided opportunity for the kids to, to, to stay if that's what they wanted. Never said you need it, you've got to stay. But, you know, I wanted I, to grow. I always heard his mom say that, he, that she wanted him to go on and try something else and then make that decision to come back. And, of course, Barry, Barry and Tony both came back. But at the same time, she was very forward-thinking in everything. She was an extension, and she probably had the first PC computer that anybody ever owned in their home, and just very forward-thinking. And she passed it on to him and was willing to go into debt to expand in order for the two families to come back and farm. And there were other farmers in the community that that were not willing to let the son go into debt to, to do what he needed to do to expand. So so they lost that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my mother really tried her best to get me not to farm, to be honest with you. She, you know, she said, go, go do something else. But I guess that really made me want to stay, didn't it? <laughs> 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 well, I, I I would try to get Ethan to stay. He was down at NC State, and besides the fact that I worried about him on the road back and forth, but he would come home every two weeks, and he finally just told me, and I would ask about girls, and, and he said, Mom, nobody in Raleigh knows who I am. The only The only person that I am is who I am on the farm, and I knew then that he would be back on the farm somehow, some way, so. And we've been blessed. We've got wonderful daughters-in-law and, uh, and two wonderful grandchildren. And boy, they're fun to spoil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's probably what we have time for today. Uh, before you all do go, I first and foremost want to thank you for coming. I hope you found it as educational and as enjoyable as I did. Secondly, if you're interested in learning more about what Barry and Mary Jane are doing, learning about opportunities in North Carolina or learning more about the services that we provide through Dairy Advantage. We're actually just across the hallway in that little room with the cheese and snacks. So go grab yourself some cheese and some snacks and stop on by our booth and see what we've got. And uh, last but not least, um, I, I, real quick, I, I have to say that I really appreciated working with Barry and Mary Jane. You know, so often, not just here at Expo or other places, you hear about all these technologies and Basically, things that we're told are there to replace our judgment. And at the end of the day, working with these guys, I just realized that you can't replace common sense. And you can't replace your better judgment. And that's, that's really why they're successful. And to trust the judgment that you make with the decisions as an owner and as manager and move forward. And uh, that's what they've done. And they help remind me of that in working with other dairy producers, so I appreciate that. So uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and have safe travel back home.
Thank you. Thank you.